All right, this video is for those of you that are the go-to Power Apps developers at your organization. It can be a struggle sometimes to understand all the different needs that people have when they need you to build an app for them. And so we got a question recently from our office hours that the person was wondering, how do I go about gathering requirements for this app? Do you have any best practices and things like that? So let's check it out. Best practice for gathering requirements is interesting. We're gonna, I'll talk about requirements, but you also mentioned testing, troubleshooting. You know, uh, I think I'm pretty sure you were you were the person that was talking about the multiple environments. So having two environments for you or three is going to be huge. Um, so being able to make changes that you can make a change in one environment and test it yourself and then deploy it somewhere else and say, hey, I want you to go look at it before I deploy it to production will be huge. Um, so when you talk of, when they talk about getting you an HR environment, don't get an HR environment, get three HR environments. Um, now, if, if it was more than just you doing this, you know, best practice, you talk about best practice, you're, you only have rights in the development environment. In the test environment, you have less rights. And in the production environments, you pretty much have no rights. That's like, that's best practice, right? Because that follows common development process, right? Um, that doesn't work for you, right? Like you're, you're the all, you're, you know, you're wearing all the hats and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, you're just, your organization doesn't have those different roles and that's, that's okay. I would still try to leverage those environments. You will, you will find huge benefits in being able to test stuff for yourself in your own environment and not mess anything up, not have something bad go wrong and break something for a bunch of people. Yeah. Like it, it'll be way better for you. So I think the other thing that can be aided by that is in the refining your requirements. Yeah, so that's what I was right. just going to say. So that bleeds into the requirements thing, which yeah. is to say, now you have a development environment, you can go throw a, a update, a potential update and say, hey, check it out. What do you think? Yeah, so one of the huge benefits of no code, low code, um, you have to recognize is the ability to like rapidly build a functional prototype and actually put it in front of somebody. So you could literally have a, you know, a half hour, one hour session with your stakeholders and they could give you kind of uh, some ideas about what they want. You could go quickly build that thing because no code, low code lets you do that so quickly and get it in, in front of them uh, so that they can actually put their hands on it um, and give you, you know, that feedback loop much more quickly. The other thing I'll say is, uh, as part of that requirements gathering thing, one of the new things that was just kind of released or announced at uh, this most recent Ignite from Microsoft was the ability to take um, a Figma uh, design. Uh, so if that's a design tool that you use, you can actually generate a power app from a uh, Figma design file, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the other thing uh, is you can also generate a power app from a sketch on a napkin. So you can take a photo of that sketch or um, you know, maybe you sketched it on a whiteboard or something like that and you can actually uh, automatically generate an application, a screen um, in a Canvas app, uh, which can be a pretty, uh, a way to speed up that process as well. Yeah, so those tools will be really good if you're if you use Balsamic or you're used to using Figma or you're used to using you know any of these tools that are wireframing tools or in the case of Figma you know full on design tools um, and want to go easily from that. So some people work with designers and they the designer takes those requirements and does those things. You know they can do those things and you can import the 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 app into Power Apps so that you have a starting point that looks familiar to what they're doing. Um, much like what Mike's saying, like when you talk about best practices for gathering requirements, people who are, if you're gathering requirements, if the reason you're gathering requirements is to create an estimate that you're going to be held accountable to at a, at a, you know, live or die kind of situation or pass fail kind of situation. If you go over by one hour, you fail. And if, if you're, you know, under, or if you're, you know, not under by too much, you're, you're, you're okay. You're good. It's, it can be a real challenge uh, because getting the requirements down to the level you need to be super, super accurate is difficult. Now, if you're doing those that requirement gathering to get a rough idea of where we're headed and get a good place to start and where to go, I think it's, it's a lot different. Um, you know, that's uh, generally speaking where you want to be in this low code world, mostly because you can change things very easily um, and the limitations are real and they are great, right? Uh, just because an end user says they want drag and drop whatever 
you can't necessarily give them that. But if that's what they had in their head and you didn't plan for that in what you were going to do and you don't have a way to argue with them enough to get them to not do it, your estimate can be blown to heck, right? So, I think, I think so what you real really want to do is you want to get into as quickly as you can into a mode where you iterate really fast, right? Um, and, yeah, you know, you got to get there. You got to get to a point where you can iterate. So, yeah, I operate on an agile um, mode. So I typically I gather requirements and it's the latter. So basically I get the requirements. It's not a, you know, um, I get the requirements more so people like begging me, we need help, do anything to help us. We're doing this via email through spreadsheets. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love so that. Anything. That's a low bar. <laughs> yeah. In that environment where you're just getting people who really want your help, you know, for me, the most important thing is to understand the high level goal. So we often, very, 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 very often, in fact, almost always want to ask, why are you doing that? Right. Like if somebody says, I'm doing this in email, what are you doing in email and why? Right. Like how does this fit into your process and how does it work overall? You know, I get um, I'll, I'll give an example from a customer. You know, somebody's like, we have this old on premise SharePoint that has workflow and we moved it into the cloud and it's never worked and I need it to work. And I'm like, OK, that doesn't help me. I'm not going to there's no magic button to say make it the same. So tell me more. Right? Like, what is going on? And come to find out what's going on is they have a third-party app that sends an email to somebody, and that email has some content, and they, instead of building, like, an integration between that system and a third-party system, they are watching a shared mailbox, they grab the content, the email, and they shove it into a list. The list triggers a workflow to ask somebody to approve it. They go look at it. They say, I like it. And then when they, they like it, they take it and manually enter it into a third party system. Like that's what they were doing. But, and ultimately they end up keep keeping the same, they kept, they kept the same process. And the reason they're keeping the same process is because they're upgrading that other system in the next year. And when they do the upgrade, they're going to go back and figure out a better way. But they weren't even having the conversation with that other partner for this new project because everybody's like, they, they don't, they don't think beyond that. Right. And so one of the things, uh, best practices around requirements gathering is I would ask where I can, where they'll let you ask more questions and get into what's going on behind the scenes. I would only gather enough requirements to get something out there to show them, you know, get a good idea of accomplishing their task. You know, I wouldn't get into a lot of detail about design. I wouldn't get a lot of detail about like just, I wouldn't get into a ton of detail. I would build a version of it that does what they say they need it to do and say, try it out, what, let's review it, and what do you want changed? We also do some things where we talk to the stakeholders and say, what are you worried about? What are you, what are you hoping this thing is gonna do? Yeah, so. Um, and so we, that helps us to get aligned with that team uh, so that we uh, identify potential pitfalls, like stuff we don't want to have happen uh, early in that uh, effort. Um, and then ultimately we, you know, by understanding the hopes that they have, uh, we know what it might take to make their dreams come true. Yeah. We want to always make sure that we're talking at least at one time to this, what we would consider to be the stakeholders of that business process. A lot of times you end up talking to the middleman. Yeah. A technical yeah. person or a person who's just doing it, you know, I want to talk to who is who will be screaming if this doesn't work, right? Like I, that's who we want to talk to at least one time and ask them exactly what my hopes and fears. Like, what are you hoping this helps you fix? What are you afraid that it won't fix or that it will, you know, what will happen as part of it? When you ask those questions, right, you can actually have an upfront conversation about like, yeah. oh, you're, that sounds like a really terrible thing. Why are you afraid of that? Like, or, help me understand that. Or right? that is a concern. You're right. right. That That's something that you should be worried about. And yep. you guys need to do something about that or we can do something about that. Right. Yep. That's exactly right. And so that's a fairly important. And I think I, even early in my career, like that's something that I like failed to do, didn't understand the real value behind it. Yeah, we wouldn't do it. But, we wouldn't do it as formally. Like literally we will have a hopes and fear conversation yep. as one of the first things we do on a project to ask the st all the stakeholders, including, you know, we talk about a middle, that's that person, including the conversation. It's not right. that we wouldn't include them, but everybody, including the stakeholders to say, 
what are your hopes, what are your fears, so that we can deal with them up front. Yep, yep, absolutely. I love that. Thank you, guys. I will add that to my list of questions and repertoire. Um, I, I've been doing this for a while, but this la last project that I got, they have so many stakeholders, and they're not even sure the process themselves. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. We need yeah. to so I just started, look, I'm going to build something and let you guys look at it because we're just going. So um, that, that's another, that's, you brought up another, <laughs> another avenue of this that's a challenge. One problem is trying to find, get a hold of all the stakeholders. Another problem is I got to hold all the stakeholders and I got 50 of them. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Uh, because they all can't agree. You know, it depends on the position, like where you, where you are related to other people. A lot of times in that scenario, I will try to make them choose someone that is in charge. So a lot of times that'll be a project manager or it'll be a major group that has the most to gain out of this thing. But I'm not going to answer, like I want input from you all. I want to hear you all. I want to talk to you all. But I need one person that's going to make a call and is going to deal with a scenario where you guys need to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Because that's not going to be, I, that's not a good role for me to play Unless that's if, if you want me to play that role, this project gets longer. It gets you know more drawn out. We like you're gonna, I'm gonna have to be way more involved in your stuff, right? Yeah. And I'm not playing the role of a, deve a citizen developer anymore. I'm playing the role of a change manager or of a mm. uh, of a project manager or a, like there's like seven other roles that you would be playing, and that doesn't make any sense either, right? It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but having that, if even if you get all those people in the room, you can uncover those things by having the discussion about hopes, fears, oh, yeah. and outcomes. Oh, yeah. But you're going you're gonna to find out where people are not aligned. Really Correct. Quickly. Yeah. Hey, hopefully that was helpful and you enjoyed it. If you want to see more content like this, feel free to hit the subscribe button down below. And we'll keep them coming as long as you guys show up and like these types of videos. And uh, yeah, so thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.